one of the best things you can do to learn about writing is to read a book. So if I read a book by, you know, Jonathan Franzen, I'm learning from Jonathan Franzen about how to write. So it's still something to this day that I'm learning about. Welcome to the Get Invested podcast, where we share great conversations with experts from all walks of life to uncover their secret know-how and where they invest their time, their skills and their money and the benefits that this has created. You see, the truth is that everyone invests every minute of every day. We're investing our time, our skills, our energy and our money in something. Some of us are investing consciously, some unconsciously, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, and sometimes for no impact. Get Invested will help you to start living by design, not by default. I'm going to help you to make it happen, not let it happen. You'll hear the top tips on how you can live with conscious intent so that you can live more, work less, and leave a living legacy by investing now. Listen to the show to discover the top tips on how to get started, make the most of your investment journey, and ultimately to be living your dream, not someone else's. More episodes can be found on iTunes or at bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. Thanks for listening, and now let's get invested. Hi, friend Fighters. When was the last time that you sat down and read a book? Now, I'm not talking about scrolling absentmindedly through social media posts or flicking through the pages of a magazine or the newspaper. I'm talking about diving deep into a really good book. And what about writing? When was the last time you wrote something? I don't mean an email or a work paper. I mean really writing something about your deepest thoughts, your beliefs, and your feelings. My bet is that for most of you, reading something deep or writing something meaningful was a long time ago, or at best, a few hours on your last holiday. And I know that you've got good reasons. You're too busy, you don't have the time, and even if you could find the time, you're just too exhausted to write or read just for the pleasure of it. Now, we all want to live an amazing life. We want to have happy and healthy relationships. We want to have fulfilling careers and lives full of meaning. We want to be financially independent so that we can do what we want, when we want, with who we want. We're clear on what we want to achieve in life. However, very few of us know how to achieve it. As a result, you may be constantly searching for ways to achieve your lifestyle goals, but you're frustrated that you're never making enough progress. But here's the good news. Achieving the life of your dreams, health, love, career, happiness, etc. doesn't have to be that complicated. And it doesn't have to take forever. In fact, we can achieve the life of our dreams faster by following the examples of the successful. How? Put simply, start by investing in reading more. Now, I'm sure you've all heard the saying that an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Well, this all starts with reading. According to Vincent Carlos's blog on why reading is the habit of highly successful people, when the world's best living investor Warren Buffett was being interviewed about his secrets to success, he pointed to a stack of books in his office and he said, read 500 pages like this every day. That's how knowledge works. It builds up like compound interest. All of you can do it but I guarantee not many of you will. Now, early in his career, Buffett read 800 pages a day, and even now, at the age of 89, he still reads for about eight hours a day. And he's not the only one. In an interview with the New York Times, Bill Gates shared that he reads about 50 books a year, and apparently, Gates takes reading vacations for two weeks at a time. Elon Musk says that he taught himself physics as well as rocket science simply by reading a lot of books. And Oprah Oprah Winfrey has referred to reading as her path to personal freedom. It's one of the reasons she started her own book club where she talks about her favourite books. And here's the interesting thing. These examples aren't the exceptions. If you look at leading CEOs around the world, they read an average of one book a week. That's 52 books a year. 
Now imagine how much more knowledgeable you'd be if you read one book a week for the next 10 years. And increased knowledge leads to better insight, which is the precursor of better choices and actions. If you read the right books, you couldn't help but be healthier, happier, and financially more successful. This is something that all highly successful people know, that if they get the right book in their hands first, the rest will naturally flow. Reading is, and has always been, the habit of the highly successful. But successful people don't just read anything or everything. According to Thomas Corley, author of the book Rich Habits, The Daily Success Habits of Wealthy Individuals, he found that successful people are highly selective about what types of books they read. Corley says that rich people read for self-improvement and education, while less well-off people read for entertainment, if they read at all. Why? Because successful people see investing in books as a gateway to knowledge and continuous learning. As a result, They tend to read books that are going to help them challenge and grow their minds and improve their lives. And if you're not continuously learning anything of value, how do you expect your life to change? The simple fact is that you can't stay at your current level of knowledge and expect your life to improve. So, working for eight hours or more a day and then coming home and watching Netflix or reading Harry Potter for entertainment probably isn't going to help you much. The alternative is to read books that are going to help you grow in the areas of your life that you want to improve in. As examples, if you want to learn how to manifest your ideal lifestyle, have a read of Dr. Joe Dispenza's book, Becoming Supernatural. It's a cracker. If you want to have happier and healthier relationships, read The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. And if you want to be financially independent, start by reading The Richest Man in Babylon by George Classen. Or, and here's my shameless self-promotion, get yourself a copy of my book, The Freedom Formula. Now, whatever it is that you want to achieve in life, there's an endless supply of books that you can get invested in to teach you and instruct you on how to do it. It's time to increase your reading. Now, I can hear you say, yeah, that's all well and good bushy, but when am I going to find the extra time to do that? How am I going to be able to read a book a week? Well, you may be surprised to hear that it's a lot easier than you think. To read a book a week that really gets you engaged, you need to read about 30 pages a day, which equates to around 45 minutes depending on how quickly you read. And this isn't that difficult. Here's how I do it. I start by searching for good topics of interest on YouTube, and I have a a listen to some presentations by good authors or good YouTube book summaries. The Productivity Game by Nathan Lorenzen does some great 10-minute book summaries, and they even email you a PDF of the key points from that book. And I generally do this in the morning when I'm getting ready, exercising, in the shower, or doing chores. This quickly gives me a good indication of the author and the book content. I also search topics of interest on the Blinkist app, that's B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, which gives you awesome audio condensed versions and summaries of books. These are both really good ways to search for topics, authors and books of interest, and then get all the juice in a book very quickly and easily. If an author or book really captures my attention, I then download free sample chapters of the book on my Kindle e-reader that goes absolutely everywhere with me. If the free sample chapters engage me and I like what I'm reading, I'll buy and download it from Amazon or Goodreads. Now, I've currently got a library of over 300 awesome books in the palm of my hand that I can read anywhere, anytime, with a book to suit every mood and occasion. And because I'm a mood reader, I've generally got between two to four books on the go at the same time. One will be a fiction novel for pure escapism that gives wings to my creative imagination as my mind visualises new times, places and faces. And the others will be a mix of non-fiction personal development books across the full spectrum of self, health and wealth. Then, whenever I can grab a few moments and minutes during the day to read a few pages, like when I'm standing in line at the coffee shop or the post office or at the supermarket, when I'm having a coffee break, when I'm in waiting rooms or waiting for a meeting, 
And yes, when I'm doing my business in today's version of the man cave, a la the toilet, much to my wife's disgust. <laughs> now, I also read and relax for 10 to 15 minutes when I climb into bed at the end of the day, and there's no better way to drift off to sleep and to prime your subconscious to process new ways of thinking. And if I really love what I'm reading, I'll get a copy of the hardcover version so I can highlight key passages and make notes. You can also listen to audiobooks on Audible or other apps while you're driving, jogging, going for a walk or doing housework. And apparently nearly 30% of us are auditory learners. Now, I'm a very visual learner, so reading books works really well for me, as seeing the words seems to help embed them deeper in my mind and imagination. And diagrams and illustrations work even better. So regardless of what's happening throughout your day, still moments to read at least 30 pages a day. You'll be surprised how much this adds up day after day, week after week, month after month. And you'll be surprised how your mind and your knowledge expands and your thinking changes, allowing you to make better informed choices. And remember that your reading needs to be highly enjoyable. So if you're not enjoying a book you're reading, give it away. Don't feel like you have to finish every single book you start. It's always better to read books that sincerely interest you rather than waste weeks trying to force yourself to read through a book just because you feel that you should. Now, by coming up with a combination of reading approaches that suits your style and schedule, you can easily get through a book a week without much effort. So I challenge you to start. And for all of you who accept the challenge and start reading a book, I'll give you a free copy of my book, Get Invested, if you jump on our website at www.knowhowproperty.com.au, hit the Get In Touch button, fill in your details, and in the Briefly Tell Us What You Need box, just write, I'm getting invested in reading with the name of the book and the author's name for the book that you are reading. I guarantee you'll start to see the world differently by taking this step. More than anything else, the information you'll learn from reading the right books will be a key to helping you to start living the way you want to live. And to reinforce the rewards from reading, socio-economist and author Randall Bell's book, Me, We, Do, Be, The Four Cornerstones of Success, confirms that those who read seven or more books per year are 122% more likely to be successful as opposed to those who never read or only read one to three books. Yep, you heard that right. That's 122% more likely to be successful. And this is what I really love about reading. You can go anywhere in the world and your mind can travel to the past or the future you can feel, see, hear anything at all just by reading and letting your imagination fly. Reading is the best way to relax and acquire information because it exercises the brain and builds your brain's muscles. And that's not all. Reading is also dramatically correlated with improved creativity, better memory, increased vocabulary, better communication, stronger analytical thinking, improved focus and concentration, greater relaxation, reduced stress, increased levels of happiness, and even greater longevity. So if you want to live the long life of your dreams, health, love, career, happiness, etc., then follow in the footsteps of the world's most successful people, pick up a book, and start reading. Reading is where your tree of knowledge and your lifetime learning begins. And if you really want to take things to the next level, then you need to transform and translate what you learn from reading and start writing. When I was a kid, I wanted to become a successful architect and an entrepreneur. I always had a pen and a pad in my hand, and I was one of those nerds who was always taking copious notes and writing everything down. I instinctively seemed to know that writing everything down helped me to clarify my understanding of things, and the way I then remembered and communicated them, and the way I could then create things in new, exciting and engaging ways. I developed written acronyms for everything because it was the easiest way for me and everyone else to remember key things and I'm still doing it. And I can still remember my acronym for the first 20 elements of the periodic table in our year nine chemistry class over 45 years ago. It goes like this, H.T. Libby Bickenoff, Ni Na Miguel Sips Clarka. That got me through chemistry. Now, what I didn't realise then 
is how much personal gratification I got and continue to get from writing. Like Faisal Hoke expressed in his Business Insider blog on how writing makes him more successful, for me, writing has become one of my happy habits that has helped me to connect better with my purpose, my world and myself. When I started writing, I was motivated by our business needs, but over the years, as I've dived deeper and deeper into writing, the greatest satisfaction comes from writing from my heart, from challenging and defining my beliefs and my thoughts. In this regard, I can really relate to Anne Frank's writings where she once said, I can shake off everything as I write. My sorrows disappear. My courage is reborn. I've discovered that writing is a way to find inspiration for yourself and for others. And just like you, don't have to be a chef to cook for yourself. You don't have to be a professional writer to get the benefits of writing. And don't just take my word for it. Many successful people are secretly regular writers. Again, Warren Buffett had described writing as a key way of refining his thoughts. And as we now know, he's a man who reads and thinks a lot. Richard Branson once said, My most essential possession is a standard-sized school notebook which he uses for regular writing. Bill Gates has described writing as a way to sit down and re-evaluate his thoughts during the day. And Tim Ferriss, Tony Robbins and Oprah are all regular writers. For all of them, writing has just become another tool for thinking, expression and encouraging creativity. As the great shipping magnate Aristotle Onassis once said, always carry a notebook, write everything down. This is a million dollar lesson they don't teach you in business school. So let me share some of the things writing has done and continues to do for me. It helps me cultivate my authentic self. Writing helps you to understand who you are, what you want to be, and how you want to fit into the world. When you write about your thoughts and feelings, it can propel you to explore your inner self, your journey, your struggles, your inspirations, and your purpose. As you let your words flow out of your head and your heart, unedited, it can take you to those seldom searched places where you can boldly ask questions like, why you're on the path that you're on? Is this what I really want? Do you like where you're going? Our unhappiness often stems from not knowing where we're heading. Through writing, it's easy to explore who you are and where you want to take your journey next. It's a way to revisit the past, connect with the present and draw a map for the future. Writing also reduces your stress and improves your peace of mind. Life, by definition, sooner or later, involves some level of pain, suffering and disappointment. Accepting and growing through our pain and our problems is part of our personal growth. This is anything but easy. Like any other skill, learning to suffer well requires conscious practice and learning. In this regard, i found writing is very therapeutic for coping with my struggles. It allows me to turn my anger, fear and disappointment into inspiration for both myself and my readers. It serves as stress relief when you turn the negative into positive by finally expressing what you feel deep down inside. Writing helps me to live in the moment, to learn from the bad times and keep an eye on the bigger picture. It has made me calm, collective and much more resilient. Writing also creates and instills rewarding rituals, happy habits and daily disciplines. Mastering an authentic craft comes from uncompromising regular practice. Developing the discipline to practice the same thing over and over again requires ritualistic hard work. In addition to my writings, playing piano every day, doing my seven minute workout challenge and my manifesting meditations are the non-negotiable important big rocks that go into every day and the remaining sand of life just fills in the gaps. These rewarding rituals teach us to be disciplined, deliberate, and meditative. Creating these rewarding rituals for your daily life provides a path to practice mastery with positive energy and regular writing. In order to write each week, as I've just done in preparing this podcast intro, as well as my weekly Bush Bite Facebook Lives and other media articles, I'm forced to read a great deal and go down a multitude of rabbit holes. I constantly have to learn, unlearn and relearn. This forces me to turn off the noise, exercise both my analytical and my creative side and constantly approach subjects and topics with a new beginner's mind and a reinvigorated childlike curiosity. 
And here's the big one. Writing also clarifies and reaffirms your intentions. Our life's direction results from our intention. What we call living by design, not by default. It's our spiritual will, something that drives us to do what seems impossible. Intention nurtures us with hope in our darkest moments, enables us to dream of better days, and resides in a place where we're destined to find our fulfilment. Writing our thoughts helps us to intend to go somewhere meaningful and to make a difference. As I said before, using affirmations and choosing positive thoughts helps us in our quest to manifest our dreams and our desires. Writing allows us to consciously put these positive reaffirmations on paper to visualise our future destiny. The ability to visualise our dreams creates a mindset that makes our ambitions possible. Understand exactly what we want is the foundation for our success. To give you a good example of this, of dreaming in decades while doing in days, let me share the diary of my ideal day from my book The Freedom Formula. It's the vision that I wrote of what I wanted my life to look like in 10 years. And I wrote this in April 2015 when my wife Sonia and I were on holiday in Bali, just before we launched the know-how evolution of our business. At the time, we were still living in our humble abode of our house in the southern suburban scrub at Aldinga Beach. Sonia was still running our property management business, and I was still working hard driving our finance-breaking business. There were no books and no podcast. Now, it's titled A Perfect Day in the Life of Bushy, and it goes like this. I wake into the sound of birds surrounded by nature, and I look out at the long-range, uninterrupted natural view from the top of the hill, down the valley to the plains and the water in the distance. I feel totally rested and then at peace, serene, cool, calm and collected and completely satisfied. I embrace and snuggle into Sonia, feeling close, connected and intimate. I feel safe, secure and relaxed without any stress, just positive pressure. I feel I have lots of time to do everything I enjoy. I'm fit, flexible and healthy and I can do anything I want physically and mentally. I have a fantastic memory and can recall facts, figures and details easily. Sonia feels loved and secure and we both love our relationship and our life. And we laugh often and loud. I spring out of bed, looking forward to the day ahead. I greet our smiling Samoyed rescue dogs and shower them with affection. I retreat to our meditation studio where I give gratitude and affirmations while soaking in the long-range view as I watch the sunrise. After stretching, I work out in our gym and then slip into the pool and swim some laps, followed by a stretch down to keep fit. I'm loving the fact that I'm still actively playing field hockey on the weekends. A quick shower and then Sonia and I take the dogs for a walk while our live-in housekeeper sets the fire and makes breakfast with organic produce grown on our property, which is totally self-sufficient. Our homestead is minimalist with strong, bold natural materials and curved floor-to-ceiling retractable glass, so the inside and outside merge beneath broad outdoor living verandas and courtyards with landscaping and running water creating ceaseless wonder and feelings of peace and tranquility. After a brisk walk, we return to feed the dogs and enjoy a luxurious breakfast while reading with peaceful music playing in the background. I then spend two hours in the studio retreat catching it with business performance reports, regional leader updates, weekly leader Skype sessions and business forecast trends. The dogs are lounging around the retreat while the open fire burns warmly and can come and go inside and outside at their leisure. After a half hour break playing guitar or piano and singing, followed by a light lunch, I then spend two to four hours working on my latest book, keynote presentation or stage hosting event, blog, video message, social media posts, and our Golden Smile Life with Paws Abandoned and Forgotten Souls program that brings together old and abandoned pets with the forgotten elderly to eliminate pet euthanasia. I finish the working day with important phone calls or meetings. Twice a week, I have lunchtime meetings with key people at our Reflections Retreat. I give monthly keynote speeches all over the world on living by design through home ownership by smart property investment funding solutions from richly, richly rewarding relationships based on my Wealth by Stealth series that highlights and funds our Golden Smiles Life with Paws programs. I have a national team of healthy wealth home ownership funding strategists who enable clients identified through my integrated icon industry attraction campaigns. 
An hour before the sun goes down, Sonia and I take the dogs for another walk and then I practice hockey for half an hour during season or have another swim and stretching session. We enjoy a light, healthy dinner watching the sunset from the balcony. And after dinner, I practice singing or playing an instrument before reading around the fire with Sonia and the dogs with music playing in the background. We enjoy a bath before retiring to bed early. For three months of the year, we travel, incorporating a mix of four to six week journeys that are combined one month healthy wealth by stealth strategy courses on a cruise or a retreat destination, along with house sitting writing retreats with the dogs in places like France or the UK. Our healthy, wealthy live by design brand incorporates a fashion style guide, health, fitness, and eating programs. That's it. Has that got you thinking? This ideal day brings together the top-down vision of your future with a bottom-up view of how each and every day looks and feels. And what is really interesting and exciting about this is that most of all of this has already come true for me in just five years. So if you write nothing else, make sure you write down your ideal future day from the moment you wake up to the minute you shut your eyes at night in vivid detail with a focus on how you're feeling at each and every point. Read this out loud to yourself at least once a week. Record it under voice memos on your mobile phone and listen to it daily. I listen to mine regularly when I'm having a shower. Yeah, sad I know, but the results have been incredible. This alone will activate your magnifying magnet compass and keep you focused, energised and committed to realising your dream life. Now, the other benefit of writing is that it also inspires and influences others. Over the years, I've noticed that truly successful people are able to inspire and influence others, and they do this through their writings. Inspiration can't happen without clear communication, and writings and books help you to do this. When you write from the heart, it not only enhances your communication skills, it allows you to connect with your audience on an emotional level. This is also useful in daily communication such as emails and social media posts and your writings can ultimately improve your verbal communications with honesty, humility and clarity. So in summary, writing has allowed me to find myself and create myself when I was looking for other answers. But most importantly, again like Anne Frank, it allows me to build courage consistently to pursue my dreams. I hope that you're going to take the time to find your voice using your writing as a tool to help you get there. So what are you waiting for? Start reading and start writing. And who knows, like me, you might just find yourself writing your own book. And writing my book has been both the most challenging but also the most cathartic and most rewarding thing that I've ever done. It's fair to say that becoming a published author author has helped build our profile, promote our business and make us stand out from the crowd. And all of the other game-changing rewards that have flowed into our lives and our business as a result of writing and publishing my books wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for today's guest, Michael Hanrahan. In my humble opinion, and from personal experience, I can confidently say that Michael is the undisputed guru of all things writing, books, and publishing in Australia. He successfully published many hundreds of books over his 20 years plus in the industry. With experience in all areas, all areas of publishing from editing to printing to ebooks and bookshop distribution, Michael started his own publishing house over six years ago to concentrate on helping small business owners like myself publish our books. This has now evolved into Publish Central. Publish Central is the leading provider of non-fiction self-publishing services in Australia with a focus on high-quality books that help you to stand out from your competitors, set you up as experts in your field, and help you to promote your business to a wider audience. Michael's been featured on radio and and podcasts and magazines and in the Huffington Post, and has written a book and a practical guide on how to self-publish called Stand Out, which is a must-read if you're looking to write and publish your own book. I encourage you to do that. Michael's also a regular presenter at the annual Small Press Network Conference and he's a co-founder of the Australian Business Book Awards which I was humbled to win two awards last year. Michael's a great down-to-earth and an absolute cracking bloke so I know you're really going to enjoy this engaging and inspiring conversation with Michael Hanrahan. Welcome 
Welcome back, Freedom Fighters. Now, I've often said that investing in writing my book has been both the hardest thing, but by far the best thing that I've ever done. And it's not without its challenges. And I've got to say that there were times that I felt that climbing Mount Everest would probably have been easier. But our lifestyle and our business has grown to a different level since writing and publishing it. And none of this would have happened if it wasn't for the massive support and the incredible orchestration of today's guest, Michael Hanrahan. So welcome and let's get invested, Michael. Thanks for having me, Bushy. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks, mate. I've uh, been wanting to have a chat to you for ages, given the, the uh, I guess, invisible and, and hidden skills that you bring to the table, mate, that not too many people appreciate in its full extent, <laughs> having uh, been through the, uh, the pain of uh, and the pleasure of writing a book. Mate, but uh, without me second-guessing all of that, can I get you to start off, uh, for the listeners who don't know who you are and what you do, to give us a bit of a rundown on all of that and then talk a little bit about why you do what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm the, the founder and director of publishing at Publish Central. So we are a self-publishing company. We specialize in what we call self-publishing for small business. So we help business authors like yourself self-publish their books. Uh, a book is a fantastic tool to help people build their profile and promote their business. So we take care of all aspects. So we, we're what we call a one-stop shop. So we take care of everything. People come to us with a Word file and have a book in their hand three months later. So that's that's us in a nutshell. Um, the reason I do what I do is um, I love helping people share their knowledge and their stories. So um, you know everybody. I don't don't quite agree with the saying that everybody's got a book in them. Most people do, but um, you know we love helping people get their knowledge and their skills out there and you know sharing this information. So many people have all sorts of knowledge that other people want and need and they you know books just a great way to get that out there yeah awesome mate uh, i mean the this the multi- multiplicity of skills that you bring to the table is quite incredible i, I you know, having been through the exercise with you a couple of times now uh, you're you're both an orchestra leader but also a psychologist and a coach and a, you name it all <laughs> wrapped into one but mate uh, to get those skills I'd, I'd love you to take us through your journey so far and go back as far as you'd like to if you don't mind and talk us yeah. through you know what you invested your time your energy and your money in and what did you learn from it what were some of the challenges and the the pitfalls along that road to, that got you to what you're doing today yeah of course well if i go back all the way my father was actually a writer so um i've been around this stuff i remember you know some of my earliest memories as a kid are going to book launches and that kind of thing so um, i've always been around this stuff so that's that's probably my my very very early starting point (laughs) um so i then i was always interested in in writing and editing um i started my first professional writing gig ever was when i was 15 years old um, so I was writing a chapter for a book about sport in Melbourne. Um, so that was very exciting. How, um, it did, ended up... How did that yep, come sorry. about, mate? That's pretty interesting. How did that come about at the tender age of 15? Uh, it was actually something my dad was working on. So he got asked to write this chapter for a book and um, I, I was a bit of a, a sports nut, specifically a basketball nut, and so he asked me to write the sports section. Um, it turned out my bit actually got cut, so it actually never made it into print. <laughs> but um, right, that, that chapter went in, my bit got cut. So um, that was my, my very first ever, I still got paid, my first ever paid writing gig. Um, from there, I started, or oh, my next kind of professional writing experience was I started writing book reviews uh, for a few different book, mag- uh, book magazines. Um, so Australian book review and things like that. So that was from about the age of 17. Um, I then went to university and did a writing and editing degree. Um, I went into it with the intention of uh, hopefully becoming a full-time writer, um, came out of it knowing that that's an extremely difficult thing to do to make a living at. Um, and I actually also, when I was doing the course, I really enjoyed the editing side of the course. So um, I actually uh, came out of it and started applying for editing jobs. Um, I got my first editing job at a small company called Write Books. Um, the job was so perfectly tailored for me. My, my sister, when I showed her the ad, literally said, um, the ad should just say, we're looking for Michael. Um, <laughs> so, you know, job ads have like, you know, 
15 criteria and you think, oh, I'll, I matched 12 of those, I'll apply. I pretty much nailed all 15 and I, I got the job. So that was my, my first publishing job. Um, I was there for about three and a half years. Um, that company then got taken over. So it was a very small publishing company. Um, there was about sort of five or six of us, including the guys down in the warehouse packing the books. And uh, we... Uh, I was actually very keen to get experience at a larger publishing company. So a small publishing company is great for learning all the ropes, but then there's kind of nowhere to go. Um, so I was keen to, you know, obviously have a career in publishing. And so, um, but while I was looking around for other jobs, uh, the company where I was working actually got taken over by John Wiley and the Sons. So um, I, I stayed there and, and, you know, went from working from a small company to a large company without actually having to change jobs. Um, so I got the role of managing editor at John Wiley and Sons. Um, I was there for three and a half years. Um, again, was kind of ready to move on and was looking around for the next thing to do. Um, I applied for a job at Penguin, um, which was in a very similar role to the role I was in at Wiley. Um, went, went for the interview, um, disliked the interview so much that I called my partner, Anna, from the foyer of Penguin and said, I'm going to go and start my own business. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Tell me what you, what did you dislike about the interview that, that caused that strong reaction at that point? Um, well, one of the reasons, um, one of the, one of the issues I had with working at Wiley and anyone who's worked in a big company will know all this is all the kind of corporate stuff type of rubbish you spend all your time doing and you know you waste all your time in meetings and just you know it's it's you know none of it's or not nearly enough of it's just about producing really good books there's all sorts of other you know the, the amount of time you spend in your day is not about producing books it's all about doing all sorts of other stuff as well um so i got frustrated with all that kind of corporate side of things and when i went for the job interview at penguin i could tell just from the interview that it was going to be exactly the same working there so um the i had been tossing up i always it had always been my plan to go out on my own. It was just a question of when. Yeah. And doing that job interview at Penguin made me decide now's the time to go and do that. <laughs> Mate, I, I want to rewind a little bit uh, if we can uh, because, you know, obviously at a very young age there's a passion for writing and I understand you're immersed in that because your your good father uh, was, I guess, living and breathing the, the author lifestyle, which would have been a, a massive guess here, but I'd love to expand on this, but uh, yeah. all odd hours, uh, late nights, early mornings, uh, locked in a, a room full of books. Can you describe, yep. you know, the, the environment that you're in and, and how that led you to have that very early passion and clearly some skill in, in writing from an early age? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, obviously, books were a massive thing in our lives growing up, me and my two sisters. Um, so, my dad, uh, he was he was a writer. He was His main thing was book reviews, which is how I got into it. But he also wrote for The Age. Um, you know, he wrote, he wrote and published three different books, wrote for all sorts of magazines, that kind of thing. Um, he was the editor of a few magazines as well. So, our, our environment growing up was a house just absolutely overflowing with books. Like, dad would literally... <laughs> build homemade shelves above the, you know, the toilet door to fit in all the books kind of thing. <laughs> so we just had books everywhere. And and I'll never forget when I was a kid, um, you know, coming home and saying, okay, I've got I've got an assignment on World War Two. And he would he would disappear for 20 minutes and come back with like 12 fantastic books on World War Two. <laughs> so, you know, not only did he have all of these books, but he knew knew every single book in the house and knew, you know, knew what the topics were and what you needed and that kind of thing. So I always thought that was just super cool when I was a kid. Um, another thing I remember is uh, back <laughs> back in the days before email um, and even, even fax machines, he used to um, – I often run into the age at like two in the morning to to file something for the um you know for the age for the next day and sometimes if I happened to be up when I was you know fifteen or whatever I was he'd actually drive me in at two in the morning with him uh, to the age in Swanston Street and things like that so um all sorts of cool memories like that um he he never had a nine to five job so I I didn't know what a nine to five job was when I was a kid I I thought everybody's dad locked themselves in a study at a typewriter so um <laughs> he would he would work all sorts of hours he'd just you know being being a writer the, you know you don't really have to have normal hours so he'd just write whenever it suited him you know he'd often you know sleep during the day and write at night just just you know whatever worked for him at the time yeah yeah awesome and the, and the, your your talent for writing because it is a it is quite a skill uh, is yes. that something that came naturally to you or something that you sort of worked at progressively with guidance and, and encouragement from your dad or 
How did that come uh, about? Definitely, definitely both. Um, so I, I definitely think I've got a, you know, a little bit of a, a bent for it. It's something you have a bit of a natural talent for. And obviously, Dad was a professional writer, so it's not that surprising that, that I've got a bit of that. But <laughs> you can definitely, you know, it's a skill like anything else. You can definitely learn it as well. And, you know, I, I did a writing and editing degree, and I certainly learned a lot about writing then. And I still, you know, I'm still learning about it. One of the best things you can do to learn about writing is to read a book. So if I read a book by, you know, Jonathan Franzen, I'm learning from Jonathan Franzen about how to write. So it's still something to this day that I'm learning about. Yeah, exactly. And there's just nothing better than immersing yourself in a book. But we'll, we'll, I'll come back to that subject shortly. Uh, okay, so you, you, you got to Penguin and that was the trigger that said, right, I, I'm out of here. You can shove this corporate gig. I'm going to do my own thing. Uh, Pretty talk much. To, yeah, talk, talk to us about the, the journey from there because that would have had its uh, challenges itself in the early days, I'm sure. Yeah, it absolutely did. So I was I was very fortunate that I had a very good relationship with the people I worked with at Wiley. My boss from the small publishing company uh, was still my boss uh, when when we got taken over by Wiley, and so I'd known her for years. We we're actually you know um, quite close. So I I did the right thing, you know, tried to do the right thing by her and told her that I was going to leave in three months. So obviously I didn't have to give them three months' notice, but I I told them that and I trusted that you know that she would you still treat me fairly, which she totally did. Um, so I wanted to give them as much notice as possible to, to plan for me being gone. Um, but the the upside of that, which I didn't expect, was they pretty much factored me into their schedule um, for after I'd left. So I, I left um, I left Wiley with like three or four months worth of work lined up, contracting straight back to Wiley. So um, so that was a very very good way to um, to go out on my own. Um, we also again you know um, the stroke, strokes of luck you get in life. We also had an absolute best selling book. Uh, right before I left, literally in the month before I left. And so I got paid a, a decent bonus from that, which covered my, my freelance setup costs as well. <laughs> so I was actually actually quite fortunate in, in my first few months. So then, um, so I mean, in terms of kind of setting up a business, at the, at the start, I was really just a freelance editor is basically what you'd call me. Um, so I did a little bit of self-publishing, a little bit of writing, but mostly it was just editing. Um, for about four or five years, I probably 70% of my work was still John Wiley and Sons. Um, and, you know, I'd just pick up other work here and there. Um, so I did that for probably in that kind of mode about six or seven years. Okay. Um, the, the challenges are always the, the obvious things. Um, I've been thinking about this bit before the, the session today, Bush, because I knew we'd talk about this sort of thing. And, and I, distinctly remember a few total freak out moments as you know I'm pretty much everyone has when you're doing something like this of, of you know planning for it and setting up and then suddenly sitting there and thinking I just got offered a job at Penguin what on earth am I doing going out on my own you know it's just wracking it doesn't matter how confident you are it doesn't matter you know you've got the skills and like I say I got a nice bit of money before I left so that helped yeah it's still a nerve-wracking thing to do so that was definitely a challenge um, the, the other thing that factored into me doing that was I had been in doing a lot of freelance work on the side anyway. So I'd kind of reached a point where I was like, well, I'm getting, you know, this amount of work freelance without doing anything. If I go out on my own and really start pushing it, surely I'll be able to get that up to full time. So, yeah. you know, that's certainly helped as well. But yeah, it's, it's a nerve wracking thing to do. Um, you know, I think that the, I don't think I had any specific challenges starting up other than like i say the usual of, of it's it's hard and it's scary and that kind of thing, same sort of thing that everybody goes through yeah okay i mean the, the financial chasm is is often the you know you're sort of jumping off the cliff from a, a regular income into the yes. you know the dribs and drabs and the big gaps between paydays when you're doing it yourself so it, it sounds like as you say you sort of had a bit of a soft landing there with the bonus on the best-selling book and the the ongoing contract work that you're doing with Wiley uh, beyond that I mean that would have started to evaporate at some point uh, were you sort of then at a stage financially where you you had enough consistency in the work you're doing that it didn't matter or were there were some days when you were sort of uh, sharing out the baked beans out of the last can in the, in the pantry <laughs> We, we did have a bit of a challenging patch. So, so what happened? So, like I mentioned, um, I kind of, uh, you know, did a lot of work back to Wiley, um, you know, for like six or seven years. And that was just, the work would just land in my inbox. I didn't even have to do anything. So, I was booked up sort of three or four months in advance. Wow. So, that, that whole period there was, you know, just 
you know, kind of just purely in terms of financially, there was, there was no, no problems at all. We were motoring along, you know, without any problems. But then uh, what happened completely out of the blue was I started to notice the emails from Wiley kind of stopped coming. And, you know, I was like, hang on, now I'm booked up for two months, now I'm booked up for one month. And, of course, I rang them up and said, what's going on? And um, they said, we've started outsourcing our book production to India. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> with, without telling me about it, so um, I have I have no problem with the decision. That's their business decision. That's absolutely fine. But you know the typical corporate thing again, typical corporate behaviour. They they didn't tell their key freelancers about it. Or at least they certainly didn't tell me. So um, so obviously that kind of had a few alarm bells going off all of a sudden. So that was actually when I. Um, uh, looked into, well, actually, when I um, kind of heard about the um, the course that you're very familiar with, Bushy, the KPI course. <laughs> and um, so that actually came along at the perfect time in my life by coincidence. So I had um, I had two people I know and, and trust very much uh, within a week tell me how good KPI was and you should check it out. So I was at this point where my Wiley work had, had dried up. So I didn't have no work, but my main client had certainly dried up. Yeah. And... Um, so it was at a little bit of a turning point. So I was, you know, thinking about what to do next. And, and this, like I say, this KPI course cropped up. And so I looked into it. I'm often very skeptical of that kind of thing because so many of those things are just rubbish. Um, yeah. But I, I went along. They had a free session. So I went along to their uh, the free one. I thought, oh, this actually looks pretty good. Then they had a, they had a breakfast, like just by coincidence, like two days later. So um, uh, Mike Reed, who, who you know, Bushy, um, yeah. Mike, um, you know, Mike invited me along. Said, "Hey, we've got a breakfast in a couple of days. Come along." So the more I got to know about this course, uh, the more I thought, "Hey, this is perfect for me." Yeah. So because, like, say the the KPI course is all about you know finding your direction and you know building your products and all that kind of thing. Um, the other factor for that was one of the things they teach you in KPI is to publish a book. So I thought, um, well, if I go along and do this course, I think it was about $10,000 at the time, something sort if I go along and do this course, I'm fairly certain we'll get at least a couple of clients out of it, which will pay the, the $10,000, you know, cost for the course. So pretty <laughs> low risk thing to do. Um, we, so I went and did the course. We rode a wave of KPI books for about four years after that, <laughs> we got absolutely inundated. So, um, that's uh, yeah. That was that was probably the only point where I'd say we had um, you know sort of concerns about where we were going in the future. But yeah, through a combination of you know sort of you know luck and good timing, that sorted itself out. Mm, and that sort of uh, led through to uh, initially Michael Han and Michael Hanrahan uh, publishing, and now more recently into Publish Central. Uh, talk us talk yeah. to us about uh, you know the, the full scope of of what. Uh, your group is now doing, mate. Yeah, absolutely. So the transition of that was um, uh, Michael Hanner and publishing that took off really quickly, like they largely on the back of just doing KPI books. Um, we knew that couldn't last forever. We were just, you know, a part of it was just being in the right place at the right time. So we started planning for what to do after that. Yeah. And what we did was we basically took all the lessons we learned in three or four years of, of running public, uh, sorry, running Michael Hannon Publishing, and we basically turned that into Publish, Cent Publish Central. So Publish Central is basically all the lessons I learned in three or four years, and we basically almost started the business again. So new brand, new website, um, you know, we've, we've got some new partnerships, all that kind of thing. So we now initially, when Michael Hannon Publishing started, it was literally just me um, in a, you know, um, glorified freelance editing role almost <laughs> when I started. Um, uh, very quickly realised, like say, took off really quickly that we were going to need more help. Um, my partner, Anna, um, who, again, you know, Bushy, um, she was at the time actually looking to wind down her business. She'd been a photographer for almost 10 years. It was just a bit tired of it. Um, so she came into the business. She actually also has a publishing background. Uh, we met at Wiley years ago. So okay. um, she came, yeah, so she came into the business. So that fitted perfectly. We'd always, always planned to work together in some shape or form. So that fit together really well. Um, then again, just to keep up with the demand, we added a, uh, we, our senior editor, Charlotte, who's absolutely fantastic. Um, again, who I knew from my Wiley days. Yes, you know her well. Oh, mate, uh, your team is awesome. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I could wax lyrical here for half an hour talking about, yeah. uh, 
yourself and Anna and Charlotte and what you did to transform a, a pig's ear into a silk purse, mate, as far as my book is concerned, <laughs> without a shadow of doubt. So yep. uh, awesome team. Talking about Anna, mate, because uh, Sonia and I also work in the business together and you yep. know, a, a lot of people shake their head and go, oh, I could never do that. What's yep. the secret to the success of, of yourself and Anna working together and, and how important do you think that partnership is to the success that you continue to enjoy? Um, well, I'll answer the second bit first. The The importance part is extremely important. So from a from a work point of view, um, she's, you know, like so she's just awesome at what she does. So that's really good for the business. Um, you know, she, she fits into exactly the space I needed her to fit into when I, you know, when things started to get busy, she's doing the things she likes. So she's she likes being the behind the scenes person. You know, she manages the printing and the ebooks and all that kind of thing. Yeah. So, from that point of view, she's really important. Important from the work side of things. Um, from a personal point of view, obviously, it's really, really important to have that side sorted out when you're working together. Um, so we, I mean, it's it's the oldest cliche in the book, but it's still true. You know, you've got to talk about everything. So we, you know, we talk about where we're at with the business. We have uh, we have rules where you know there's times we're not allowed to talk about business. Um, so, you know, like if we're walking the dog and things like that, it's like just no business. And occasionally, you know, if one of us starts to talk about business, the other one would say, look, I don't want to talk about that right now. And you say, absolutely, that's that's the end of the conversation. <laughs> so, you know, we all, you know, even when you work together, you all need time to take a break from work. So that's kind of very important. Um, the other thing that helps us a lot is we're both uh, quite independent people away from work. So, um, you know, uh, we've you know, both got our own things we like to do out of work. I and mean, obviously, we do heaps of things together and spend heaps of time together. But we also, you know, do heaps of things apart and spend heaps of time. Well, not heaps of time, but spend time apart <laughs> doing our own thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, so that all helps as well. So the fact that we're, you know, together nine to five during the day, um, you know, I might then be off playing basketball in the evening or something like that. So, you know, it's, it helps break things up. But, or, you know, she might, you know, she has a regular friend. She has a, a Friday morning coffee with that kind of thing. So, you know, being able to, if you're working together, being able to do your own things outside of work, I think is very important. Yeah, really healthy, I think, mate, because uh, it keeps injecting uh, something fresh into the relationship without a doubt. It's the same reason I play piano and, and still run around making a nuisance of myself on the hockey pitch. For yeah. <laughs> exactly the same reasons. Mate, yeah. uh, I mean, you, things are, are coming together really well for you. It, uh, would you say that you're actually living your dream lifestyle now or, or how would that differ from what you sort of envisage as your ultimate uh, ideal lifestyle, mate? Can you sort of paint a picture uh, for us? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. So the, the answer is... Um, loving where we are right now, enjoy every day, you know, get up excited about what I'm doing, um, but not quite aiming at the dream, not, not quite reaching the dream, dream lifestyle yet. So in terms of where Anna and I are working towards, um, my plan is to get to the point where I don't have to work. So um, obviously, I, I'm fairly certain I will still keep working, but I do want to get to the point where uh, where I just feel like I don't have to work and I can spend more time doing other things I want to do. Um, but in terms of where we are right now, I, I'm absolutely loving where we are right now and, and certainly very excited about what we're doing for sure. Yeah, and, and that don't have to work is the is the, is the key bit because the mental pressure that disappears when when you're in that position, I I, I can't even put a value on it actually. Uh, yeah, tell me about what when you don't have to work. What what else will you do differently, mate? What comes into the picture? Um, yeah, so certainly, um, I, I like to, I'm sure I will still work. I think I, mm. I would end up more of a. Um, you know, kind of consulting, you know, advising, coaching kind of role. So guiding people through the process rather than actually doing the work myself. Yeah. And that's not to say I don't enjoy doing the work uh, myself because I still do. I still do editing. I still do a bit of typesetting. But that's the kind of the next goal is to not be doing that. Yeah. Um, then that would also leave time for, you know, like a lot of editors, uh, I've got a whole drawer full of novel <laughs> ideas that I want to get to one day. Um, <laughs> they also started when I was about 15 with my try hard Isaac Asimov novels. But um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so certainly that and just things like exactly like you, you were mentioning, like your hobbies, Bushy. So things, you know, um, you know, I, I play guitar. I wish I had a lot more time to do that so I could I could sound less bad. Um, <laughs> you know, 
go, go um, you know, just, just just go for a motorbike ride, go hang out with the family, that kind of thing. So for me, the ideal would probably more more be be like you know working kind of three three and a half days a week, and then just having a bit more time to do other things. So I did I did have one patch in my life where I was consistently working four days a week and having three days off. And the change that makes it's only one day, but the change that makes to your lifestyle is amazing. Yeah, and so that that last that worked it for me for about a year, and that was just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it just lets the air out of the balloon, doesn't it? And it just sort of means you're sort of more energised and you've you've got more headspace. I think. Yeah, absolutely uh, does. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of moving towards that, uh, you know, most people. Uh, generally tend to invest in their work and, their, and they focus on their income. But I've, I've seen those that achieve that sort of freedom that you're talking about invest in growth assets that include uh, their business, obviously, but also potentially shares, super, property. What, what's in your head as to what's going to contribute to funding that lifestyle ultimately so that you can choose when and how you want to work? Yeah, well, certainly the business is obviously a, a big part of that. So we're... we're We've kind of spent the last couple of years putting everything in place with Publish Central. So we actually put quite a bit of money into the website. It's actually a pretty high-end website. Um, you know, there's a lot going on on the back end of it. Our plan is to really build it out over the next few years. Um, we've set up a YouTube channel. We've got, you know, we've, we've really consolidated our social media. So, we, you know, that's obviously all both time and money investment uh, with the longer term plan being obviously for that to both get us some, to, to get some income for us uh, um, in the shorter term, but then also with the plan for an eventual business sale. So that was one of the reasons behind the name change was to get my name out of the name of the business. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in, in three, four, five years time, we are, you know, the plan is to get to a, get to a point where we can sell the business. So that's the business investment side of things. Um, we do also, I, I manage a, a kind of a family portfolio that we have. Um, so we've got two investment properties, um, uh, it's kind of split evenly over two investment properties, uh, a share portfolio and, and cash holdings. So they're all, um, all of those are planned with the longer term time horizon for, for me and my sisters, basically. So, um, that's none of that. We we don't dip into that at all in the short term. That's all very much part of our longer term planning. Yeah. Okay. So is that something that um, uh, you've inherited that you continue to manage, or is that something you got together with your sisters and said, right, oh, let let's put this together and 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 get a mix of property, shares, and and cash? How, how did that come about? Um, mostly an inheritance. Yeah. So from my grandparents, uh, or from our grandparents, about seven or eight years ago. So. Um, so that's now it's all kind of uh, my job to manage that. So we don't, I mean, I say manage it. We actually don't do too much to it. Um, you know, we just keep an eye on it and, uh, you know, occasionally make adjustments to it. But that's all all looked after in terms of the, uh, you know, longer term planning. Mm, so the, 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 I don't want to go into nth detail here, but I'm, I'm assuming there's probably a family trust that this is attached to that you're sort of managing ongoing. Is that how it's sort of structured? Because it's, it's interesting that your sisters remain in it quite often. The, the family exercise can p- present its own challenges as the dynamics of people's lifestyles start to uh, change over time. How, how has that come together? Yeah, no, that that's exactly what it is. So oh, that's what some of it is anyway. There's a, there's a few other things in there. But, yeah, that's, that's part of the structure. So... Um, we are uh, we're fortunate that me uh me and my sisters and and my mum my, my my dad's no longer around he, he died a number of years ago but um me and my sisters are, are very close and look obviously you can never guarantee you're never going to have problems but you know i don't foresee us having any issues we all um you know we all kind of know where we're at we've talked about it all there you know i'm i'm far from an expert but i know more about this stuff than they do so it's kind of in my hands to look after it and i just you know tell them what we're doing and most of the time they say yeah that's fine so yeah i can certainly i mean obviously you can you know you hear horrendous stories about this kind of stuff but you know uh we don't have too many concerns about that mm, that's awesome mate that's, that's and it, i guess if the if your sisters and yourself have decided this is our do not touch money we're just going to let this do its thing and and grow over time to give us the the comfort of a nest egg that's going to fund your ongoing lifestyle at, at some point in the future that's that, that's a perfect fit so, um, yeah, it works for all of us. None, none of us have, um, you know, any sort of, you know, immediate financial concerns. So, I mean, that's, you know, it, it's there if we did, but it's, you know, it's, uh, we don't, none of us have day to day pressures that we need to access that. So, 
Mm, and the, and the uh, you, you know I'm going to ask this question because I've got the uh, property bent. The the properties that sit in yep. that uh, portfolio, what what are they, mate? Are they rental properties? Are they properties that your uh, family were living in that have become rental properties? What what's the background on those? Uh, one of one of each. So one of them is an apartment uh, Anna and I bought about eight or nine years ago, and uh, so it was an apartment in East Hawthorne. And when we moved out and out that apartment and moved into our current place we we kept the apartment and that's now rented out so that's how that one came about and then the second property is an investment property we bought in ballarat about three or four years ago so we um we contacted an an investment advisor a property expert and uh told her how much money we had to invest and she said um bang for your buck at the moment she said ballarat's the place to be so um yeah so we purchased a place in ballarat I reckon I know who that is. She, is she a fellow KPI? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, a, and a good decision, by the way. Uh, regional regional areas of the state are going to continue to perform very well, particularly given the impetus that COVID is pushing people further away and further out, uh, then yes. that's going to perform extremely well. So well done. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Um, uh, I, I sort of went off on a little bit of a, a, a tangent there. I'd, I'd sort of like to come back now to the, the heart and soul of uh, what you love doing and, and uh, has become a growing love and a passion for me. And that is, that is the, 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 the science and the art of writing, Michael. Yes. It's, uh, and I, I guess the obvious question I'm going to ask you around that to start with is, why would someone write when when we live in a world that's covered in noise from social media, from stuff in our earbuds like like this podcast, to videos, yep. to you know, there's a thousand different ways of getting your information. Why why would someone still take the time to sit down and write? Well, I books are still doing really really well. So that, I mean, that's the first. It's um, you know, kind of like the the story that you know when when everybody had a video in their house, they said movies will be dead and all that kind of thing, and that didn't happen. Everybody thinks everything that comes along is is going to kill the previous thing, and it, it doesn't always. Books are uh, books have certainly that sales trended down for a few years um, over the last three or four years, but they've actually ticked up again a little bit before you know um, before the latest lockdowns and everything, which which have. Um, Heard everything, but you know, books are, are actually in in roaring good health in terms of sales and that kind of thing. Um, in terms of the authors we work with, so like we've talked about, you know, we we specialize in self publishing for small business. The authors we work with, the book is actually a marketing tool to help them build their business. So um, it's all about you know building your profile. You know, um, you've you've had all of this first hand bushy, so getting you know getting TV experience uh, exposure which you've had um, getting on podcasts, getting magazine articles, all that kind of thing. Um, they're all the sorts of things you can get from writing a book for your business. So um, in terms of that area of publishing, it's actually, you know, I mean, as I've said, we've been flat out and growing for four or five years. So that area of publishing is is absolutely going great guns. Yeah, yeah, no question about it. And and you've sort of touched on the, the, the second question I was going to dig into, and that's, you know, firstly, why write, but then why write a book? Uh, you, yeah, you've certainly uh, started to dig in to that as well, and I, I guess it's it's the interesting thing. I, I can certainly say from my own perspective that uh, you know when I first got on board with KPI and and you challenged to write a book by the infamous Andrew Griffiths, uh, <laughs> your first question in your head is, well, why would anyone want to read a book that I'd written? That I, I can't possibly know anything that's interesting enough for people to read what, what, yeah. what's your response to people when when they sort of come up with that initial reaction yeah we we, we hear that all the time so the the first we, we kind of get two reactions and, and andrew and i talk about this all the time two two common reactions are uh, number one what have i got to say and number two who would want to read it so um my response to that is always, um, if you're, if that's genuinely true, if, if you genuinely don't have things people want to say and you're writing a book for your business, um, you've got bigger problems than thinking about writing a book. So um, <laughs> it's, it's 
anybody who has been running a business for a couple of years can write a book that people will want to read. So it's so easy to get caught up in, you know, like, so for me, it's publishing, obviously, every day I'm talking to editors, I'm talking to designers, I'm talking to printers, and you just get immersed in it. And you think, oh, this is just, you know, you kind of almost assume that everybody knows this stuff, and no one's interested in it. But then I'll, I'll go out for dinner, and I'll sit down next to someone who says, you know, what do you do? And I tell them, and they say, oh, my God, I want to write a book. And they, you know, they chew your ear for three hours, because they want to learn all about it. So it's, it's very easy to, to kind of forget how much people want to hear the information that you've got. So like I say, anybody who's been in business for even just a couple of years, um, and even if you're just remotely good at what you're doing, um, you know, you've got enough knowledge to write a book and there are people out there who want to read it. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I, I think one of the, the hidden things for me, Michael, was that uh, in, in sitting down and going through – uh, the exercise, and it, it, as you remember, it, it probably took me longer than most because uh, my bloody perfectionism gets in the way. But um, uh, I, I found it a very cathartic experience, but also I came out at the other end of it communicating far more clearly with much more, you know, a lot more clarity around what I said and how I said it than ever did before writing the book. So in, in terms of actually getting the message out there, uh, not only in terms of the leverage it gave us in, with press exposure and you know all of the stuff that flowed uh, from that, but just being able to talk to people about what we do in a much clearer fashion that they got interested in and engaged in was just a was a benefit that I hadn't actually contemplated. Do, do you see that a lot in in other authors uh, in a similar fashion? Yeah, we, we absolutely do. It's actually a very good hidden benefit of writing a book. And I actually went through that myself. So I wrote a book about how to self-publish a book. And before I did it, we actually sat down and formalized what we do into the steps so, so that I could then go and write about it. So that's, you know, that made us sit down and look at everything we were doing in the business just so I could write the book. So, yeah, we, we do see that happen all the time. You've got to sit down and think really clearly, you know, about what you're doing and, and how you're going to explain it to people. So it's, it's a great way for, for you to, you know, get some own intro, your own introspection on what you're doing. Yeah, 100% agree. So if someone says, okay, well, perhaps, perhaps you know, I, I have, you know, I'm, I'm either in a business that I can do or I've got an important role within a business that I think I, there's a message here that, uh, you know, I've, I've got some unique experience that I'd like to share with with others, uh, where do they start, mate? Uh, I mean, you, you know this process like an orchestra leader, as I've already said, but uh, to, to coach someone through the exercise from initial seed of an idea through to the end, can you just take us on that journey? Yeah, absolutely. So it's actually not that complicated. So um, the, the thing to do is actually start at the other end. So you've got to be able to answer the question, uh, two questions to start off with. Why are you writing the book and who's going to read it? So you've got to answer those questions before you've even sat down and thought, well, what am I going to write about? Because you can't decide what you're going to write about if you don't, if you don't know who your readers are going to be. So if you're writing a book for your business, um, you know, uh, sit down and have a think about, well, what's one of the most common problems our, our um, customers have? What's, uh, you know, what information do we get asked over and over and over again? Uh, you know, what sort of information do we know people really need? Um, so that's kind of a really, really good starting point. Um, then uh, I often suggest starting, uh, once you've done that first step, and you've come up with a topic for your book, kind of a, a general broad topic, is actually just do a bit of a brainstorm. So, um, you know, you should be able to, like if you said to me, okay, do a brainstorm on how to publish a book, I could write down 200 things, you know, without thinking about it. So any, you know, again, any person who's been doing something for a couple of years should be able to do that. Um, that then becomes your kind of starting point for what should be going in your book. Um, obviously, this is just the real, real quick version of how yeah. to do this. No, it's good. Then, then the next step is to go through and pick out what you think the key topics are from that area, uh, from from those uh, topics, from those subjects you've written down. So you know you should be able to go through and pick out a eight to ten topics. So for me, you know, okay, well I could write down a hundred things about publishing. What's the main things people need to know? Well, they need to know editing, you know, design, printing, Amazon, that kind of thing. So pick out the really key topics. That becomes your contents list for your book. So you need about sort of seven, eight, ten of those. 
and that forms the start of your, your contents list. Now, that might change later. That's not set in stone. Um, the next thing you want to do then is you should be able to fill in that contents list with all the other topics that you've written down. So have a look at what you've written down, um, so see where they fit into your contents list. And before long, you'll have a, a, you know, a list of kind of, you know, seven, eight, nine topics with another list of seven or eight, nine or nine subheadings underneath that. Um, that's, you know, suddenly you're already starting to get a contents list for your book. And then if you're writing, say, a, a 30,000 word book, um, then it just becomes filling each of those in with, you know, 300, 400 words rather than thinking, oh, I've got to sit down and write 30,000 words. Where do I start? Suddenly you've just got a whole lot of little topics that you have to write about. Now, there's, there's obviously a lot more to it than that and it's more involved than that, but that's kind of the Cliff's Notes version of it. Yeah, no, and absolutely spot on. You're sort of breaking down the elephant into mouthfuls that sort of follow the follow the skeleton of the the elephant, if you like, so that uh, yes. it chips away and, and turns the the mountain that's in your mind into a, a series of molehills that progressively get you to the end, which is exactly how I ended up doing it. And, and you know, just on some of the suggestions that I got from yourself and and uh, the infamous AG that I thought were really useful uh, were that I, I actually had photos of the, the ideal person that I knew that is the sort of person that I want to be communicating to and I had them sitting in front of me so that I was actually talking to them as I was writing and I just found that I, uh, it, it made, this, made the situation much more real and, and uh, much more tangible in, in, in the way I wrote uh, in a language that I thought would be more engaging to them. Is that, is that yeah, something that's no, fairly no. common? or It is, yeah, that's a great idea. And certainly that's one of Andrew's very good suggestions as well. So, um, yeah, we, we, um, you know, we encourage authors to do that. It's all about, you know, as I mentioned, if you don't know who you're writing for, um, how do you know what you should be putting in, what you should be putting in your book? So um, going that next step of literally kind of having a, you know, a picture and, and you know, kind of key characteristics of them uh, can be a very good idea while you're writing. Yeah, it's, there's, I've heard mixed views around the the idea of well, uh, write how you talk, uh, and I, I I didn't end up doing that. But uh, yeah. what what's your view around that? Um, yeah, that's that's a very interesting one. Um, I kind of half agree with that. So your your book should um, it should reflect your personality. Um, and you can write a book kind of in a conversational tone. So I think that's, that's kind of more rather than putting it as write how you talk, um, which is how somehow, you know, so some people often express it like that. Um, I don't agree with it so much when you put it like that. Um, but writing in a sort of a conversational tone can work really well for some people. Um, the, the reason that can work for, for people is some people simply find it hard to, to get started and they don't know, you know, never written a book before. We work with first timers all the time. So, um, you know, it's just a good way to start. So, you know, um, like you say, Bushy, stick a, stick a photo next to you your computer of um you know the kind of person who you think you're writing for and pretend you're just sitting there explaining it to them so you know writing like that can definitely work for some people for sure yeah okay so you sort of you're starting to put this thing together you've got the skeleton you, you, you're belting your way through it you you come up with this uh, uh shoebox <laughs> word yep. document that that sort of overflowing at the seams and, and bursting a thousand yep. directions so what yep. what's the next step from there mate yeah, so very good question. The first thing to realise is that is where you should be. That's what a first draft is like. Um, you know, my first draft was a mess. You know, everybody's first draft is a mess. Um, you know, people, when you go in to buy a book in the bookstore, you've never seen the first draft. You don't know that it was a mess. So you think that's how the book was written. It definitely wasn't. So don't be at all concerned if your first draft is a mess. It's a lot better to have 30,000 mess words down than, than 5,000 words that you're still slaving over. So once you've gotten to that point um, of 30,000 messy words, uh, your next step is, it depends, it depends how, you, how confident you are in your writing, your next step is usually to go back and do a second draft. So simply go back through and tidy it up. So, um, you know, like I say, first drafts are often messy. So go back through it. Um, you will no doubt move a few things around, make some additions, make some deletions, that kind of thing. So go through it again. And then you might be at that point if you're happy with it enough. It's, if it's kind of starting to take shape, that might be the point where you start talking to an editor who will be able to take you the rest of the way. So we have some authors who, who get there, you know, after their second draft. We have some authors who go through four or five drafts. Um, you know, it's really up to you and kind of, you know, each author what their writing style is like. Yeah, I think I ended up doing three 
edits with Charlotte and, and I've got to say, uh, you know, I talk about the, the, the pig's ear and the silk purse, that, that's where the magic happened. Uh, with with the editor that that was uh, editing isn't proofreading it's it's really uh, taking someone who knows what they're doing and understands what the reader wants to read and how they want to read it and uh, the shape shifting that that uh, Charlotte and your team put together for me it just blew my hair back when uh, yeah yeah really worthwhile part of the process and something that if someone's serious about writing a book uh, don't uh, shortcut that part of the process because that that will make or break the quality of the read at the end of the day i believe yeah no you're absolutely right bushy people do not realize what editors do they that you know the often you know, the common misconception is you just kind of fix the spelling and put the commas in the right place <laughs> and the author does all the work um i i've worked on books that that i've edited that honestly should have had a name on them rather than the author's name <laughs> so, yeah so don't feel as an author that at the end of the second draft or the end of the third draft, as the author, it's your job to make it perfect. It's absolutely not. Uh, it's your, as the author, you're the expert in what you do. So, Bushy, you're the expert in property. Um, we're the experts in books. So, you're the, your job is to put together the information. Our job is to turn it into an awesome book with you. So, don't feel that you, it's your responsibility as the author to, to make it all, you know, shiny and brand spanking new. That's, that's what you do with your editor. Yeah, and I, I've, as I say, what, what I loved about that process, uh, you know, she she would say, right, well, we're going to take this bit out, and we're going to put it here, and we're going to shift this over there, and and just the flow that came out of that that process in terms of the readability was quite remarkable, actually. So um, yeah, yeah, a bit of rearranging is a very common part of the editing process. Yeah, really worthwhile, and, and it's uh, you get so close to the you know the it's the old can't see the wood for the trees exercise when you're yeah. up to the eyeballs and when you've got fresh eyes on it like that. Uh, yeah. d- just a magic part of the process. So you've you've got you've got an editor. You've been, been through two or three edits. Uh, where do we go from there, mate? Yeah. So so the next step uh, after the editing is design. So um, there's two design stages. So there's the cover design and the interior design. Um, we often start on the cover design actually right at the start of the process. That's so that the author gets the cover early in the process and you can start putting it on social media using it to promote your book, all that kind of thing. Um, The design process starts towards the end of the editing. Um, So, I mean, the the way we work is we have conversations and obviously we went through this process in a lot of detail with you, Bush. You had had some really strong ideas of how you wanted your book to look, which is fantastic. You're very polite. Um, You're very polite, Michael. (laughs) (laughs) It's your your podcast, Bush. You have to be. Um, So... um, so, you know, some authors come to us and, and, and honestly say, I've got no idea you guys do it, which is fine. Um, some authors come to us with very clear ideas about they want and again, what they want in their design. Again, that's absolutely fine as well. So what we do is we have that, you know, basically consultation, you'd call it, with the author. We then go away and do some different interior designs for the author to look at. Um, and then we go back and forth with them until they're happy with the design. And the cover goes through the same process. Um, and then we format the book for them. So we've been talking about a 30,000-word book, which is, you know, typical length for these sorts of books. So the design would usually take about two weeks um, to complete the whole layout. And a 30,000-word book might come to about 160, 180 pages. Um, we then send it back to the author to read again. So this is kind of like you were talking about in the next editing stage. So we send it back to the authors to read again. They usually make a few more changes at that point. Um, send it back to us again. Uh, we take in their changes. And um, that's kind of the ed- end of the interior design stage. Mm, and then, then it's into the, the hard act of getting the, the things actually published uh, which is a very re- rewarding there's nothing better than opening that first box of books uh, and seeing the baby actually uh, ready to be baptized it's uh, yeah. it, it, quite a, a thrilling exercise and you, and you must while there's a i guess the thing that uh, i'd say to the listeners is uh, would really encourage you if if you've got some niche expertise or you've been in the business for a few years uh, there's no greater process and no greater leverage that you can add to your business in terms of credibility and opportunity than writing a book. Uh, really encourage you doing it. And yes, you will need to sweat some blood, sweat and tears to make that happen, but worth every second of it. And the, the other thing I would say on this is that uh, don't shortcut the process by uh, trying to reinvent the wheel yourself. Uh, it was almost revelational uh, for me to uh, be lucky enough to uh, get yourself and your team to assist me in 
in creating that baby. And uh, I, I don't think anyone really understands the depth and level of work that needs to be done. And, you know, a big part of that, I think, for you, Michael, is it's actually managing the author. Uh, so, you, you know, you're probably a bit like a movie producer, I reckon, where you've got the egos of the author, you're trying to you're sort of, you're trying to train a, a wild horse and at the same time produce a good book out the other end of it. Uh, I, I take my hat off to you, mate. Yeah, uh, thanks, Bushy. There's, there's, that's definitely part of it. We, we sometimes think we should add counselling services to our quotes. Um, <laughs> it's... It's, you know, it, it is a nerve wracking experience, you know, it's, um, you know, p- putting your book out there, okay, you're doing it for your business, of course, you know, the authors we work with, but it's still a very personal thing to do. And people do get, you know, they get nervous about it, they they get attached to, to what they've written. So they've been working on it for, you know, three months, six months, even 12 months, some authors. So it is, you know, it's very personal. It's very important to them, especially for first time authors. Um, you know, we do often have to really give the author some encouragement to, to get the book through those last steps and get it off to the printer. So it's, you know, which I, which I fully understand. Obviously, it's easy for me to say to them, the book is really good. Don't worry. People are going to love it. Um, and, but then it's their book. They've never, never done it before. So I, yeah, there are definitely some nerves involved for sure. Well, I think it's also uh, you're bearing your soul, and that's that's uh, yes. often a very vulnerable position to put yourself in. And uh, you know, you've put heart and soul into it. You're not really sure how people are going to react to it. So uh, I can see why people start to get the speed wobbles towards the end. It's like, oh, hold on, I'm getting very close now, where I actually have to to put my ghoulies on the line and put it out there for people to criticise me. I'm, am I ready for that? Yeah, there's there's absolutely that element to it for sure. Yeah, well, mate, um, really interesting process. Uh, how did in the in the world that we're sort of now moving into with uh, e-books and audio books, how do you see that sort of integrating with uh, the process? And what do you believe is the the value of perhaps turning a, a hard copy book into audio book and e-book fashion? Is that is that something that you cover these days? Yeah, absolutely, we do. So. Um, yeah, it's certainly that's evolved a lot in the last few years. So, you know, sort of 10 years ago, um, there were basically two standard book formats. There was hardback and paperback, you know, from, from the point of view of a publisher. Um, then along came ebooks. Again, kind of like what we talked about before, everybody said, oh, ebooks are going to kill print books. And, you know, everybody for a while was a little bit nervous, but of course they didn't. Um, ebooks had a, really big spike for a while um the ceo of sony who started up sony started up their own bookstore infamously said um ebooks are going to kill print books in the next three years um the sony ebook store went out of business about two years after that um so uh, print books are definitely are not dead um so they they've actually settled into um you know most publishers kind of consider the three formats for your book now are ebook uh, print book and uh, sorry, ebook, paperback book, and hardback book. Um, so not every book does all of those, but they're the three different options. Just starting to creep in now as kind of being considered a standard part of the process is audio books. So before long, I think the standard four options are going to be audio book, ebook, paperback, and hardback. So um, we we now are pretty much at the point where you. We're, where we're saying to authors, you kind of have to do an audio book these days. Um, two years ago, we didn't. Um, you know, two years ago, like, yeah, they're just starting to get popular. Um, these days, they're getting more and more popular. You know, everybody's used to listening to podcasts these days. Um, you know, we're all so busy. Everybody's always, you know, doing a million things at once. So audio books are definitely increasing in popularity um, and pretty much uh, at the point where you really should do one. Um, ebooks are non-negotiable. You have to do an ebook these days. Um, you haven't properly published your book if you haven't done an ebook these days for most authors. Um, occasionally, there's a reason not to. Like if you've got a, a really complicated layout or something like that, you, it might not work so well as an ebook. But um, yeah, pretty much all of the authors we work with do an ebook. Yeah, no, awesome, mate. It's pretty exciting. I, I guess the the good part of what you're doing is with with these uh, sort of alternative mechanisms and mediums to communicate the book, uh, it's, it's creating uh, a, a lot more excitement and opportunity for Publish Central as well, I'm guessing. Yeah, it definitely is. It's, um, you know, we've uh, we actually just recently, um, given given the new environment that we're all in, created an e-book only package for our authors. So um, 
we deliberately didn't do that until the last year, until until what's going on now, um, because the uh, the sort of authors we work with who are publishing a book for their business, it's very very important to have the print version of the book because you can you know you can hand it out at meetings, you can literally hold it up at a conference. I've seen you on TV, Bushy, with your book literally sitting on the counter in the middle of you and the person interviewing you. So <laughs> and to guess. Yeah. yeah, so obviously you can't do that with an ebook. But that's that was before you know COVID nineteen. Now we're all living in a different world. Um, just having an ebook is now a viable option because you know so many things are moving online. Uh, you know, digital the digital world. Obviously, it's been much more important over the last you know five or ten years, and it's absolutely even more so now with what's going on. So um, yeah, definitely the environment's changed, and that's changed how people are seeing ebooks and audio books right now as well. Mm, yeah. That, uh, any anything else on the horizon that you think is going to come into into your world uh, that that uh, budding authors or existing authors need to be aware of uh, over and above what we discussed there, mate? Um, the the major thing, uh, the major issue we've been helping our authors with lately is it's not nearly as big as the um, audio books and ebooks, but it's online book launches. So um, that's definitely something to get your head around. I think. Uh, you know, obviously none of us know what's going on right now in terms of longer term, but it, it'll be a little while before you're allowed to get more than just a few people in a room in a lot of places. So um, online book launches are definitely something that we've been doing a lot of work on lately and giving our authors information about that. So that's kind of another thing that's changed recently. Mm, yeah, awesome. Mate, uh, been a, a great conversation around that subject and uh, I, I guess any final words around that in relation to anyone that's listening at the moment that that uh, either might have been contemplating it or thought, well, oh, no, that's, yeah, it's a nice thing to do but I never get around to it. What, what, what words of encouragement would you give them? Yeah, so we, we talk to authors all the time or, you know, budding authors who, who are considering writing a book and just can't, you know, quite find the, you know, the kind of the, the time and the energy and the motivation all that kind of thing to do it or they're having the uncertainties we talked about. Um, the, the simple answer is, like we've talked about, you just have to be an expert in your area. You don't have to be an expert writer. So people sometimes say, oh, I've never written a book before. That's, that's fine. You don't have to. So, um, you know, just get down and start writing and get the help you need. So there's people out there, you know, a lot of people like us, people like Andrew Griffiths, all sorts of good services out there who can help you with your book. So don't let that deter you. Don't think you have to be, you know, a standard of, standard of a world famous novelist to write a great book. Um, and the second thing I would say is um, I see absolutely every day of the week the benefits that a book brings to a business. So we stay in contact with our authors after their books come out. Um, I always find the timeline is about three months after the book comes out and the author rings me up and says, oh, my God, I can't believe the things that have happened since I published my book. So, you know, even though we tell them beforehand, here's the things that are likely to happen, you don't quite understand it until it actually happens. So, you know, we've had people get, you know, invited to speak at major conferences because they sent in a copy of their book. We've had, again, plenty of authors on TV. Um, you know, all these sorts of opportunities start to come your way um, because you've written and published a book. Yeah, uh, I, I can talk firsthand to that. I um, mean, I, I would never, if someone had said to me four years ago, you would, you'd be on 60 Minutes and, and a whole heap of TV shows and, and some of the keynote speaking opportunities that have, that have come out of the, all because of the credibility that the, the book gives you, I, I would have laughed in your face, I think. Um, yeah, pre, absolutely. But it's just been, uh, it just yeah, it's a really great ride. It it, it becomes the the leverage and the credibility piece that I think that uh, that's still psychologically uh, in most of us. If you've written a book, you must know what you're talking about. There's a, that sort of elevates your uh, credibility and authority. I think in the space, and uh, suddenly you are viewed. You may be an expert, but you're viewed as an expert once you've got a book. Uh, to yeah, hang that's out on. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. Which yeah, um, you know, in this world of you know blogs and and podcasts and everything these days, which are all fantastic, um, there's still you know not many people who've written a book. So um, you know, it still does set you apart from everybody else. No, I love that, mate. Uh, well, I'm going to pivot beautifully now into the ambush series, uh, Michael, which is just five quick questions that the listeners all like to glean your words of wisdom on. And yes. uh, given you you would be a, a reader extraordinaire, uh, what's your favourite quote and why? Yes. So my favourite quote is, if you wait by the river long enough, the bodies of your enemies will float by. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, I love that. Where did you get that from? It's from Sun Tzu. It's the art of war. It's it's all about patience, which I think I think I think one of the things people people get in trouble with so often with everything in life is not being patient. So I yeah, that's one of my favorites. I think about it all the time. I think um, striving for short term results is is a real you know it's a real problem for people and uh, you know especially starting your own business all that kind of stuff. Patience is so important. 100%. It's uh, one of the key ingredients of being a successful investor. Is yeah, recognizing absolutely. It's at least a 15-year journey and, and then embracing that and not yep. not trying to fight it. No, that's that's awesome. What about uh, – I mean, you, you would – there wouldn't be too many people that have seen as many books as, as you have over the time. What What's the top book that you'd recommend – people read and why and and give us a couple if you think if you don't want to narrow it down to one give us a couple i was i was actually just about to say butchie i'm going to be really disappointing on this subject i don't have one <laughs> i've been thinking about this for days and um you know there, there's just not one there, there really isn't um you know obviously <laughs> i spent all day every day reading all sorts of books so i mean from from a business point of view we've got all the you know all the usual ones that you know the e-myth revisited and and all that sort of thing um you know all of those books are fantastic so, um, you know, I mean, our, our good friend Andrew Griffiths, you know, I was reading Andrew's books 10, 12 years ago before I ever even met him. So his, his books are absolutely fantastic for anybody starting a business. Um, you know, the most important thing is to just get out there and, and, you know, start reading some books and finding out about this stuff. Um, if I had one book uh, that I would say, you should absolutely read this book. You'll learn everything you need to know, and off you go. Um, of course, I would I would give that to you. But um, the more important thing is to be out there. You know, I mean, you know, if you're investing, Bushy, read read your book. You know, it's, um, <laughs> you know, I literally don't have one. So um, what, I'm sorry. That's yeah. What, what about outside the loop? Then I mean, you've mentioned the art of war. Just in terms of yeah. general interest, that what's what's the book that's captured your attention and the one that you enjoy most that you found perhaps coming back to. You? Um, oh, well, from a personal point of view, I kind of joked about Isaac Asimov before. Um, so anyone who's a science fiction fan, um, you know, Isaac Asimov, the Foundation series is, um, you know, one of the series of books that really moved me on, you know, the power of writing a book. Um, so um, what else? Um, oh, I just, I don't even know where to start, Bushy. Um <laughs> <laughs> it's the old story, though. You you don't ask an accountant to do your tax, and you don't uh, yeah. don't expect an architect to have a finished house. Uh, if, if you're immersed in books all day, every day, you'd be like, nah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, there's just there's just too many. Um, you know the. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the authors we we work with, you know, they've written highly specialised books around their top around their topics. So. Um, you know, you can find books out there on anything that you want. So I'm literally just looking at my shelf now. We've got books about, you know, how to become a salesperson, um, how to start your business up in Europe. Um, you know, we've got specific books specifically for tradies. We've got books about, um, we've got a book specifically about how to um, uh, run a business for the NDIS. So, you know, you can find a book out there on just about anything that you want to these days. Yeah, no, 100% agree. Now, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here to something that yep. a lot of Aussies feel like they pay too much tax. So what, what's the top thing that you've done to legally minimise the tax that you pay, Michael? <laughs> well, legally, the things that I can tell you about. Um, so, um, no, no, we, we're not dodging our taxes. Um, so... Um, what we, we we haven't probably done as much of this as we should have, to tell you the truth. But one thing we do have is um, we've got a an investment bond, um, which, uh, to be frank, I don't understand the details of. <laughs> but our, our our investment advisor said this has tax advantages, so do it. So we just regularly pay into that, um, and we also have. Um, uh, oh, no, we haven't done it yet. We're planning to make some extra superannuation payments as well So, because um, there's tax advantages in that as well. Yeah. So that's the main thing. So that's um, so I mentioned the, um, you know, kind of our, how our investments are spread out uh, before. That's that's one of the things that, you know, we, we consider to get some good diversification is that investment bond. Yeah, love it. Love it. Awesome. Mate, uh, on, the, on the investment subject still, what's both the worst and the best piece of investment advice that you've received to date? So the, my, one of my favorite uh, pieces of investment advice is actually from Warren Buffett. Um, I'm a really big Warren Buffett fan. Um, and it's, I can't remember the, exactly, the exact wording, but it's basically when the taxi driver starts giving you share market advice, it's time to get out. So 
Um, I think that's absolutely fantastic advice. It's, um, you know, one of the great, tools for success in anything you're doing is actually doing things differently from everybody else. Um, if you do things the way everybody else is doing them, you're going to end up where everybody else is. So um, I think that's a fantastic piece of advice. Um, the worst piece of advice, and you, you'll probably cringe at this one as well, Bushy, is, worst piece of advice you just hear everywhere is, um, is uh, you know, property never goes down. So, um, you know, I think that, that probably makes you cringe as well. Obviously, yeah. property is a fan investment but um you know people have this attitude that you ne never lose on property in inverted commas is um yeah not very clever no, so like, i think that yeah probably probably about the worst piece of investment advice i've ever heard yeah i start to gag when i hear that mate uh yeah, <laughs> yeah it's normally someone in a in slippery shoes and a sh shiny yeah. suit that's, that's <laughs> trying to, get exactly. to tell you that yeah, yeah no yeah. that's that's awesome mate uh, back on the personal front then what what's a, a personal habit or ritual that uh, contributes most to your success today. Um, look, I I think it's it's actually again a really simple one. It's just hard work. It's and and you know we we all know so many people who have lots of skills and have lots of talent, and you just never see them take advantage of it. Now, um, you know I. You know, I have no opinions on what people do with their lives. You can do whatever you want with your life. But I know people who are not happy with their lives. Um, but they, and you know, they've got all these skills, but they've just never done anything with them. So, you know, it's just, you know, it's what your parents tell you from grade five kind of thing, work hard. But, it, you know, it's actually true. It's, you know, there's talented people everywhere. I, I work with small business owners all day, every day. And the absolutely without doubt irrefutable thing they all do is work really 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 hard so um you know that's that's what we do i, I know bushy i know how hard you work um you know it's such a such a simple but such an important part of success 100 percent agree and it's uh, i think uh, it's how you perceive it though uh, that people see hard work as exactly that as a very painful experience I, I, I don't know yeah. about you but I actually get a lot of enjoyment out of immersing myself in something and, and really going for it I, 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 there's a, yeah me too for sure yeah so it's it doesn't feel like hard work it, 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 it's certainly in investing heart and soul but it, it never feels like hard work really yeah but, exactly uh, right. very sound advice mate the final question uh, and it's a big one if, if if I gave you a microphone that spoke to every single one of the 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, mate, and I gave you one minute to talk, what would you say? Yeah. Um, right now, it'd be stay home and wear a mask. But, um, <laughs> but um, beyond that, look, I, I think, you know, I, I think a lot about what kind of, uh, you know, you look at what goes on in the world. I think so many of our problems, this goes back to the quote that I, I had before, so many of our problems come from short-term thinking. And that's, you know, that's not just investment. That's, you know, everything in life. So, um, you know, if you think about the long-term results of what you're doing, uh, that's, you know, and plan for that and work around that, that's how you end up getting where you want to go. Um, short-term results uh, always, you're aiming for short-term results, always gets you in trouble because anything worth doing is going to take some time. So um, that that would be my, my short piece of advice to 7.7 .7 billion people. <laughs> yeah, I love it, mate. Yeah, absolutely so true, mate. Uh, it's, you know, it, <laughs> the, the, probably the reason why I admire the Japanese culture so much, they they think in generations, in, in, in yeah. de decades, not days. It's a, a very yeah. different way of thinking and... and uh, uh, much more enjoyable, I think, when you take that exercise because it, it actually reduces your expectations and the the, the risk of, of being unhappy if you are adopting a, a much longer time frame. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I agree 100%. And again, again, coming back to sort of things that, you know, just I've seen people I know do, um, you know, in terms of sort of starting and running businesses, and I have no doubt you've seen this with business and investment and all that kind of thing as well, Bushy, is that people start something off and it hasn't worked in four months. And they go, oh, this isn't working and they try something else. I know I know a couple of people who have, have been through kind of four or five or six business iterations over like three or four years and none of them have worked. Whereas if they'd picked one of them and stayed with it, they'd probably be doing really well by now. So it's, um, yeah, I, I do think it's a cause of many, many problems is short-term thinking. 
Yeah, I love it, mate. You're singing my tune there. Mate, it's been awesome, yeah. mate. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, I'm excited about uh, uh, where Publish Central is going to go, and I've, I've got to commend you and Andrew Griffiths on the Australian Business Book Awards. I think the initiative that you're doing there to, to give uh, – uh, recognition and also awareness for the great work that uh, a lot of authors are doing is, is second to none, mate. So uh, keep up the great work and, and look forward to staying in touch. Yeah, uh, thanks, Bushy. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on and thanks for your ongoing support as well. Thanks, mate. Talk soon. Cheers. Thanks, Bushy. Bye. Well, Freedom Fighters, how good was that? To get a summary of all this investment gold in the show notes, just email me on hello at khgroup.com.au. It's H-E-L-L-O at khgroup.com.au. Or check us out at www.bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. I look forward to joining you next week for another episode of the Get Invested podcast. So thanks for listening. And as always, dream as if you'll live forever and live as if you'll die forever.